So let's think a little bit then about uh, Ethernets uh, in practice. So um, they work very well when they are lightly loaded. They work less well when they are heavily loaded. So again, we're talking about the early um, you know, coaxial cabled Ethernets uh, and twisted pair with hubs where the collisions were a major problem. Um, once uh, the network load increased too much, then you would have a lot more collisions and the overall efficiency would drop. And so this was why things like token ring were used um, and were you know, uh, promoted uh, by various people because they didn't have this collision problem. The token was actually used. It was a bit like having you know uh, uh, the conch that you pass around in a um, uh, or a ball uh, in a group discussion, and only the person with the ball can talk. Uh, the token ring uh, token was used in the same way to basically stop uh, you know, collisions of conversation on the network. Um, so generally speaking, most Ethernets um, are used in you know, in this way where the um, the maximum load is quite unlikely to be anywhere near uh, the maximum. So typically less than a couple of hundred hosts, often, uh, you know, only a few dozen uh, were used, um, many fewer than the maximum of 1,024. Uh, likewise, most Ethernets weren't two and a half kilometers long. Uh, and as a result, tended to have round trip times that were much lower. Um, Again, because of this nice feature that it was sort of fully distributed in its design, um, you mostly use passive cable and no switches or additional equipment between them to um, uh, that could fail. Uh, and you didn't have to worry about routing because it was a broadcast medium. All of this just kind of made it really uh, cheap and easy uh, to deploy Ethernets. And so this led to, uh, to the, the growing dominance over time of Ethernet. And then of course the technology has been updated uh, as time has gone on, and so it's retained the uh, you know, advantages. Uh, let's flip from Ethernet with cabled networking across to wireless links then. Uh, so in wireless links, we're not using a, a wire to transmit uh, the uh, binary digital signals. We're using some kind of uh, you know, uh, free space uh, electromagnetic uh, transmission. So that could be radio or microwave, it could be infrared, um, it could be laser. Um, and in some ways, it's not greatly different. Again, we look at Ethernet, a cabled standard came out of the Aloha radio network. Um, and as a result, has a, a very radio kind of feeling uh, collision detection scheme to it. And indeed, it's this uh, you know, efficient sharing of the bandwidth among uncoordinated transmitters that is one of the, uh, the big problems uh, with wireless networks. Uh, one of the other things that comes up, of course, is if you're wanting to share a limited spectrum resource over a large area, you have to kind of work out, uh, you know, where uh, the separate users of that and the separate clusters of activity are and try and minimize the interference that they will cause one another. Uh, so in some cases, uh, you know, a, a company or a group may pay to license their own dedicated spectrum so they can use it without contention from other users. Uh, in other cases, uh, organizations will use, uh, if you like, you know, the, the kind of the, the common band, uh, frequency allocations that are available. So Wi-Fi, for example, works in these common frequency allocations at 2.4 and 5 uh, gigahertz, whereas a mobile phone operator, they need their service to work. So they will actually pay very large sums of money uh, to license large slabs of spectrum to enable them to operate uh, their networks uh, for people. So this allocation process uh, differs by country. So in the United States, it's the Federal Communications Commission. Here in Australia, it's ACMA, the Australian Communications Media Authority. And they're responsible for uh, the allocation of all spectrum, not just for computer networking, but for all sorts of uses. So some of it will be reserved for defense or government use, some for AM and FM radio transmissions, television, satellite communications, mobile phones, uh, pages, garage door openers, uh, all manner of things. Um, and within that, as we say, like with Wi-Fi, there are some bands that uh, you don't need to apply for a specific license for. And this is really an innovation that's only happened in the last 25 to 30 years. Uh, and so now we have bands that were allocated for industrial, scientific and medical use, ISM bands, that now also tend to have a uh, permissive blanket license 
for use for things like Wi-Fi. Um, but as I say, they're still operating under a license. So you still have to make sure, for example, that you don't have a transmission power uh, that's too great uh, so that you're not going to interfere with everybody else using it. Uh, and this is, well, it's one of several reasons why things like Wi-Fi and garage door openers and uh, cordless phones, back when people used to use cordless phones more, uh, were uh, you know, limited in distance in some way uh, so that you could share the spectrum uh, with others. Uh, in comparison, the very first mobile phone system in the UK um, just had a dedicated frequency for each phone. Uh, so, you know, the, uh, the ministers could drive around uh, anywhere in uh, the UK uh, with their car that had basically a boot full of electronics uh, that would let them make phone calls and receive phone calls uh, from where they were. But that's not a very efficient use of spectrum. Now that everyone wants to have a mobile phone, uh, there wouldn't be enough spectrum. And so uh, we have to look at ways that allow the spectrum to be spatially reused. So the same frequency can be used in different places uh, by different people at the same time. Uh, and the key to that is limiting the range of that transmission. Um, also, in the case of things like garage door openers, you don't really want, if you're at work, and accidentally bump your garage door opener, that your garage at home 45 kilometers away suddenly opens. Um, that wouldn't be that great. So there's some, actually, there's some natural advantages to um, uh, limited communications range as well. Um, again, if we're looking at the, uh, like the Wi-Fi uh, in the 2.4 and 5 gigahertz bands, um, they often also have restrictions apart from the power level that you have to kind of use some mechanism to kind of spread and smear the signal uh, over a wider band uh, so that there's no kind of peak in your transmission that's really going to cause problems to other people. So this basically means that the interference of each user um, is just a, a slight increase in the background noise uh, a bit like at a party, right? You have the, the kind of the conversational noise gets louder as more people are in the room talking. Um, and that's a much more comfortable situation than if there's some one really loud person that you uh, can't ignore because they're kind of you know, laughing or snorting loudly over the rest of the party, right? Um, so, you know, in spectrum allocation terms, Wi-Fi de devices are not allowed to snort or laugh loudly. Uh, they're just allowed to chatter away uh, in the background so that it blends in. Um, Another approach uh, that's often used is the requirement for frequency hopping. So this is often, uh, you know, again, as another alternative for a spread spectrum, rather than staying on one thin channel uh, over a long period of time for certain things, um, you can use the thin channel, but you have to kind of hop where it is around randomly, uh, or pseudo randomly rather, in the, um, uh, the frequency band. So that the probability of any other user being interfered with by you on a continuing basis uh, is very low. And of course, the sender and the receiver for frequency hopping have to use the same uh, sequence of hops, otherwise they won't be able to track each other's communications. Um, another direct, um, sorry, the spread spectrum technique is direct sequence uh, spread spectrum. Uh, so in this case, uh, each bit in the frame um, effectively has multiple bits in the transmitted signal um, and exclusive ORs that uh, with a, a set of random bits. Uh, and that this effectively generates a, a pseudo random signal as far as it's looking uh, on the, uh, the spectrum, which again helps it to, uh, to hide uh, in, the, uh, in the background. Um, and so the, uh, if this is done in parallel across multiple frequencies, you end up with a signal which is appreciably wider in frequency. But again, the, the transmit power at any particular frequency can be lower so that it blends in with the background noise and yet it's still discernible uh, and reconstructable uh, at the other end. Uh, so for example, if we have our data stream, so again, the, the bit rate on the data stream is much lower uh, typically than the, um, uh, the random sequence to which it's exclusive ORD. Uh, and then uh, we send the exclusive OR of the two, and we can see that there are higher frequency elements because there are narrower pulses than in the original signal. Um, so it's spanning a, a wider frequency band than uh, if it was the original data, uh, original sequence alone. So there's a, a bunch of different wireless um, transports that are available, um, and they do vary quite a lot. And 
kind of two of the, the key things that uh, you know make for differences is the bandwidth that they provide and the distance, uh, the maximum communications distance that they support. Uh, and in general, those two uh, have an inverse relationship. So if you want very high bandwidth, the distances are usually shorter. Um, and if you want very long distance, then uh, the bandwidth is usually narrower. Um, if you want to try and have longer distance and higher bandwidth, uh, then you usually need to have higher transmit power. Again, this all comes back to having a high signal to noise ratio and a high uh, channel bandwidth, uh, you know, the, the frequency range, so that you can get more bits per second through. And of course, the further you are away, the weaker the signal sounds to the receiver, and so the signal to noise ratio uh, is reduced. Uh, and so the, the data rate that's available and achievable at that range reduces. So this is why if you want really fast cellular or Wi-Fi data, you have to be quite near to the tower or the access point. If you go further away, um, it will reduce the data rate that it's able to deliver to you purely because your signal to noise ratio uh, is going to be lower. Um, so for quite well-known uh, wireless technologies, we have Bluetooth. Uh, that's you know, often used for, you know, for headsets and uh, phones and those sorts of things. Um, Wi-Fi, which is based on the 802.11 uh, standard which is really designed to kind of be the, um, you know, the, the wireless equivalent to Ethernet. Um, then there is WiMAX at a 211.16, which is kind of designed for longer range uh, distances than Wi-Fi. Uh, and then of course we have you know, 2G, 3G, 4G, 5G uh, cellular uh, as another option. Uh, but there are many others in there. So uh, again, I was speaking earlier in this video series about the work that we do for disaster communications in Pacific Island nations. Uh, and there we're using HF radios, which have a range potentially of thousands of kilometers if the ionosphere is playing nicely. Uh, but if we can get 2,400 bits per second on a, um, uh, a HF radio link, you're normally pretty happy with yourself. Uh, so again, you know, this trade-off of uh, distance and bandwidth at a given power level uh, very much holds. So again, we see this if we compare uh, three of these. So uh, Bluetooth um, typically has a, a shorter range. Now the trick with Bluetooth is it has very low transmit power uh, so that your batteries last a long time. And so compared to Wi-Fi, its distance is shorter and its data rates are lower. But um, as a result, your power consumption can be much, much lower because you don't need a high signal to noise ratio to get that two megabits at 10 meters. Um, Wi-Fi, on the other hand, uh, and this is a little bit dated, this is um, 802.11g at 54 megabits and 100 meters. Of course, now there's uh, N, AC, and, uh, and the like. This can go up to you know, it's a gigabit or more, um, still at some tens of meters. Um, and the way that they uh, have increased the bandwidth available on Wi-Fi is either to use, well, essentially is to use wider frequency bands, and of course to um, uh, to reduce the distance to require a higher signal to noise ratio to get the highest of those speeds. Um, and then we have cellular. So in the case of 3G cellular, the order of about 10 kilometers uh, is feasible with 3G. Um, and you typically get hundreds of kilobits per second up to about a megabit per second on 3G. Um, 4G um, is interesting. It's actually 4G incorporated a number of advantages from uh, one of the competitors to the 2G, 3G, 4G uh, GSM approach uh, from CDMA uh, that actually enabled it to get longer range communications um, and higher data rates uh, by using uh, more intelligent modulation methods and by using uh, a different spread spectrum approach. And of course, uh, 5G now over short distances gets uh, you know gigabits per second as well. Um, one of the interesting things that you tend to see with wireless links today is that they are generally based on some kind of infrastructure. Um, so we'd say that they're asymmetric, that you have a phone tower and that's feeding many phones, or you have a Wi-Fi access point uh, feeding uh, many uh, Wi-Fi clients, rather than them being a truly peer-to-peer -peer, uh, or ad hoc kind of uh, configuration like Ethernet was. Um, and this is typically done so that the quality of service and the power consumption of the, the link uh, for the clients, which is often a mobile device with a, a battery, uh, and so it wants to preserve its power consumption, uh, is that 
having that infrastructure lets you do, uh, you know, coordinate between the senders and receivers in a much more energy efficient manner by telling the receivers that they need to listen, the clients rather, some of the time, uh, for example. Uh, and so there's, yeah, there's good reasons for that. Unfortunately, for things like disaster resilience, uh, this means that if a phone tower goes out, then you can't use your mobile phone, even though in theory, it's capable of communicating to other phones uh, nearby. Um, so again, as we're saying, right? So you have, in the case of Wi-Fi, a base station that can be shared by uh, arbitrarily many, almost, uh, client nodes, certainly dozens to, uh, to hundreds, perhaps. Um, and the base station coordinates with those clients to energy efficiently uh, communicate. And then the base station will actually connect those devices onto uh, a wired network typically, uh, and often then onto the, uh, the internet at large. Uh, okay, and we'll continue that in the next video.